My name is Pat Gunn, and this is another piece of cultural criticism. In particular, we're taking a look at uh, criticism made by the Muslim Brotherhood of a United Nations uh, program uh, concerning the status of women. Now, the United Nations program is done by um, so it's done by a particular organization with the UN, uh, the United Nations Entity for Gender uh, Equality and the Empowerment of Women, which is, in my opinion, a gen uh, generally praiseworthy group. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in particular here is that of Egypt. Uh, since uh, Mubarak was removed from power, um, the United Nations has elected their first president uh, of Egypt. And we've this has been an eye-opening event for the Western world because firstly we've seen Salafis which are a much more radical group uh, involved in political Islam uh, they were much stronger in these elections than anyone could have predicted if I remember correctly they uh, showed up with about 25 percent of the vote uh, and the Salafis are considerably more fundamentalist than the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood has also been very good at embracing the internet and getting out their message. And this is good for cultural criticism because we can see what they've uh, posted and they've done us the favor of translating a lot of it into English. Uh, I don't actually uh, speak much Arabic. I can kind of sort of read uh, read it on a good day, or at least sound it out, but I have such a small vocabulary. But um, the Muslim uh, Brotherhood, uh, as I said, they've translated many of their materials into English, and they're proud of them, uh, the, of these materials. They're writing for a portion of society that appreciates their message, but we can see that their message doesn't have a lot of appeal to the uh, to modern, western, particularly liberal uh, uh, people. So I'm, I decided to take a look at this particular piece of commentary because it's a great example of how, how much your audience matters in terms of how your, your message is judged. I'm sure that the Muslim Brotherhood message here is well received by certain circles in Egyptian society. But to us, it really, uh, in, in the West, those of us with the liberal bent, uh, or even, even conservatives in, uh, in the West generally would see this message as being uh, far right and completely crazy. And it appears that I have a cat joining me on the, uh, on the uh, video blogging here. This is uh, Beefalo, and hopefully she will stay on my lap or stay on the ground. Anyhow. Uh, I'll, I'll include the URLs for, for both of these documents uh, in the description, uh, but let's read through uh, selected portions of the Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, review, and then I'll, I'll look over the uh, original uh, UN document, or at least one of the UN documents that's covered by the, by the Muslim Brotherhood uh, release. Um, I'm hoping that I don't get any of this out of context. You, you should be able to find the surrounding context for all of this uh, in both of the source documents. I am going to interlace both with commentary uh, when I have something uh, particular to say. Hopefully it'll be also clear when something is my commentary versus when it's the source text. So let's begin. <clears throat> The 50, uh, so this is the Muslim Brotherhood document. The 57th session of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, taking place from uh, March 4th to 15th at the UN headquarters, seeks to ratify a declaration uh, euphemistically entitled The End of Violence Against Women. That title, however, is misleading and deceptive. That, uh, the document includes articles that contradict established principles of Islam, undermine Islamic ethics and destroy the family, the basic building block of society according to the, Egypt, uh, Egypt, the Egyptian constitution. The constitution, I should note, is one which recently uh, the, president, uh, the president of Egypt 
just managed to push through. It was rather controversial in that um, it didn't see a lot of input from uh, other groups of, uh, of society, and a lot of people criticized it for uh, for lacking balance because of that. It, it was dominated by Muslim Brotherhood ideas. Now, we, the criticism isn't as strong as it could be because the Muslim Brotherhood did effectively win this election. But when you're f writing a constitution for a country, people might uh, might feel that you should need more of, uh, more of, a, uh, of a majority and uh, you should possibly need to represent more factions in society than just what you can uh, barely get through your legislative body. But that's a complicated matter. There are a lot of ways to lay out a government and when you're in a state of, of crisis because you don't have a government laid out yet, um, people might be more forgiving if you just need to get something together. Conceivably you can rework this stuff at a later stage, although it's questionable how much they've closed the door to that. Anyhow, this declaration, if ratified, would lead to a complete disintegration of society and would certainly be the final step in intellectual and cultural invasion of Muslim countries, eliminating the moral specificity that helps preserve uh, cohesion of Islamic societies. And they offer 10 points of criticism for the UN, uh, uh, the UN document. Firstly, granting girls full sexual freedom as well as the freedom to decide their own gender and the gender of their uh, partners. Uh, that is the choice to have normal or homosexual relationships while raising the age of marriage. So I have trouble seeing any documents that would do these things, uh, or I, I have trouble seeing rather these specifics as a criticism. I personally don't recognize uh, the ability to choose one's gender. I'm op I operate from a gender framework where sex equals gender, and normally sex is a statement about genetics, although I recognize that there's kind of a parallel concept of genital gender that's more or less parallel to that, and conceivably somebody could have a different genital gender than proper gender. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, I guess I, I wouldn't object to a government that defines uh, sex and gender differently. By and large, I think that how people think about sex and gender uh, it depends on their particular philosophy, and I don't have a lot of a, uh, a lot of problem with anything that doesn't seem to be based on malice. I'm certainly most comfortable with uh, with frameworks that don't place a lot of particular importance uh, in in terms of personality and social role uh, on what gender somebody is. In fact, I think it's probably appropriate to do activism against any individual or group uh, that that does see um, a particular gender as having necessary particular social roles or personality characteristics. But, um, but even still, I expect a certain amount of variance on that uh, topic. There, there are going to be religious people. There are going to be people who just don't see things the same way. And I want to focus any criticism of that on the practical. Are they actually denying people of, uh, of either gender the opportunity to participate in the workplace, or are they very strongly steering or trying to make illegal um, people who make uh, career choices that they don't, uh, they don't like? If they don't do either of those, then I don't have a big uh, problem with them even if they're not as comfortable as they might be, or if, uh, if they would prefer to raise children or nudge people in ways that, uh, that I don't fully approve of. This is a running topic in, in social activism. Uh, we want to have a certain amount of respect for mental pluralism, people seeing things in different ways, but we also have notions about desirable social out uh, outcomes 
and uh, it's it's appropriate to, uh, to to find a tension there and to try to work with that tension in ways that are respectful both of our desired outcomes and of mental pluralism. So, <clears throat> so yeah, we're working, uh, getting back to that first uh, criticism, I don't really see it as a criticism. Having a higher age of marriage uh, in, in the countries that permit marriage at age 12 or 8 or, uh, or even 14, uh, I think a higher age of marriage is healthy. One of the problems that uh, traditional societies have often had is that the, it amounts to a hidden means for, uh, for wealthy men to control uh, women by by uh, having a social norm that women get married um, before they have the chance to become self-sufficient. Uh, and when you combine that with workplaces that are generally not very accepting of women working, uh, you end up essentially having parents being keen to get young women out of the house uh, once they get near adulthood. And so, uh, yeah, the women can't support themselves and so getting married early to, uh, to an, uh, a typically older man, but the age isn't really important unless the, the man is much older. But it essentially means that women don't have a path to really choose maybe not to get married, maybe to marry another woman, uh, maybe just to wait and uh, find someone who they develop romantic attachments to, uh, rather than whoever shows up at their door who's willing to support them. I think that it's highly socially undesirable that women get married or really are, are forced into marriage before they effectively have a choice. So a, a later marriage age is, is helpful here. Um, and full sexual freedom is, is healthy. Letting people choose the gender of their partners is healthy. And, and yeah, having, uh, having heterosexual or homosexual relationships or marriage, that's healthy. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it's more healthy than the alternative. The more choice that you give people over the types of relationships that they enter into, uh, generally the healthier society is because when when people are long-term partners they should ideally be the partners that are uh, they, they find each other's company good they have romantic feelings they find each other attractive and they don't have a strong power component uh, in their relationships it isn't one person who, who has all the power, or, or even one person who has all of a particular kind of power. So yeah, quality in relationships is healthy. Um, the second point, uh, the second thing the Muslim Brotherhood document worries about, providing contraceptives for adolescent girls and training them to use those while legalizing abortion to get rid of unwanted pregnancies in the name of sexual and reproductive rights. That all sounds good to me. Uh, I think providing contraceptives for adolescent girls and guys because uh, if if guys have sex with each other or a guy wants to take the initiative and in getting the contraceptive, why shouldn't he? And of course contraceptives are helpful between women as well. It helps prevent the spread of STDs. This is generally a, a sex ed uh, topic and sex ed is healthy. When, when somebody has pregnancy before they're ready to take care of uh, a child, it really shapes their life in ways that can be, uh, can be harmful to them. It limits their potential as a person. Uh, and why not let people choose to raise uh, kids if they're going to have kids when they're ready? And if they decide that they're not interested in that, let them make that choice as well. Uh, if, if we really want to create a society that's uh, friendly to human flourishing, um, where people can reach their mental uh, potential, where people can have a career and a family if they decide uh, to have a family, if we want to best do that, then uh, having people have better control over if and when they have a child is essential. 
Uh, as for the third, granting equal rights to adulterous wives and illegitimate sons resulting from adulterous relationships. I don't have a lot of uh, op opinion on this matter. In, in the sense that when a divorce happens, I think it's fine that in the West we typically have the notion of divorce with cause and it ends up shaping uh, how property is divided in a divorce. Um, I think that's reasonable. I think it would also be reasonable to have uh, equal division of property in a divorce. Um, I think one of the reasons why we might prefer not to have such a strict notion of with cause is that often uh, the weird stuff that ha uh, that can happen in divorce uh, happens in the context of a relationship that's not really working very well, and oftentimes there's uh, there's fault that divides both ways. Not always, um, but basically, I, I think this is a complicated enough matter that I don't think it's clearly off to decide to have reform al uh, along these lines. Um, but I don't. I also don't see it as as a clear win to have reform along these lines. Um, and uh, with regards to handling of uh, illegitimate uh, children, I I also don't have uh, a lot of opinion on that. Although I would prefer that handling of of children. Uh, I think that it it should ideally, uh, ideally be gender neutral. Uh, existing standards of giving more to people based on what uh, what uh, gender they are, uh, I would consider that unfortunate. Um, so granting equal rights to homosexuals and pr providing protection and respect for prostitutes, let's consider each half of that. Uh, granting equal rights to homosexuals, I think, is healthy. I, I don't see anything negative about granting equal rights to homosexuals in society. I generally, I, I'm of the opinion that the, to the extent that society paves paths uh, for certain uh, life patterns and, uh, and goes beyond making something legal but makes something easy and uh, sets up defaults for it. Like marriage, marriage is not uh, a legal concept about what's, uh, uh, about whether something is permitted or not. It is a paving of a path, but I think that that path should be paved equally for uh, for homosexuals and for heterosexuals, and um, uh, basically because I think relationships are about when two people, ideally in a romantic, exclusive, long-term aiming relationship, decide to merge some other social identity uh, into each other. And, uh, and people already do this without the state. Like, I think people would refuse to testify against their partner, regardless of whether they had particular legal protection for doing so. And, um, and so it's, it's basically a, it's a bit of a paving of the path to decide that legally, uh, partners don't need to testify against each other. And it's a paving of the path to, to decide that by default, um, in a marriage, uh, if people haven't made other arrangements, then the assets are distributed a certain way should one of them die. Uh, and visitation rights and all of these other things, they amount to a paving of the path. And I believe that that path should be, paid, uh, should be paved for uh, homosexual relationships just as much as heterosexual ones. Um, with regards to protection and respect for prostitutes, I think protection is certainly important. We, we don't want uh, prostitutes to, whether they're behaving, or whether that type of uh, activity is legal or illegal, we don't want them battered and having no recourse. Uh, I personally am of, the, uh, am of the opinion that prostitution shouldn't be legal. Um, and my reasoning for that is that when people depend on a job, it limits their, it effectively limits their ability to leave that job on a moment's notice. And I think that's fair in, uh, in normal types of employment. People develop a economic dependency on their job. But I don't think that, the, that that's as fair 
for sexual activity. I, I think sexual activity is something which people might theoretically be able, uh, I mean, people consent to it, and people might theoretically be able to decide uh, as a particular instance to trade uh, sexual activity for money. I, I'm roughly okay with that. The, the problem is that if it becomes uh, a career or a job, then the dependencies that are acquired um, uh, of that job or of that kind of work mean that people effectively lose that agency when it comes to their sexual activity. And I see sexuality as being enough of a specific thing that, that any long-term contract or anything that amounts to effectively a long-term contract uh, is unex uh, unacceptable. I don't think it, it's acceptable uh, to hold people. Uh, like if somebody signed a contract saying, for 10 years I will be sexually available to you in return for $10,000 now, I think that that would be unconscionable. And for that reason, I think that, uh, or basically in, per in along that line of reasoning, I think that, that prostitution should not be allowed uh, because it uh, it effectively allows for that type of dependency. Now it might not be a strict dependency, and maybe we would be able to find a middle ground of some kind. But I don't think it would be able to sufficiently uh, eliminate the coercive elements of having uh, a job that I believe we need to be especially wary of when it comes to sexuality. So uh, in any case, I, I would be concerned if their actual uh, if if this mandate actually required countries to make prostitution legal. But as we'll find out when I uh, take a look at the UN documents, I was unable to find any evidence uh, of this being a topic of con uh, concern in the UN doc uh, in the UN documents that at least I found so far. Now that's not saying that there aren't necessarily or that there necessarily aren't any uh, documents that uh, address this topic, but I was unable to find any uh, anything suggesting that. So the the fifth complaint they have is that giving wives uh, or giving wives full legal rights to file complaints against husbands, accusing them of rape or sexual harassment, and and thus obliging comp uh, competent authorities to, to deal uh, punishments to husbands similar to those prescribed for uh, raping or sexually harassing a stranger. This is an area where U.S. views have shifted over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, we, many states used to have, used to permit a husband uh, to, uh, to demand uh, forcibly, if necessary, uh, sexual activity from a wife. Um, and the, the laws have changed a lot on this topic, and I think uh, those changes are very healthy. Uh, I believe that entering a marriage can't create uh, any type of, uh, or it, it can't create obligation of that sort to be sexually available to one's spouse. Now, I, I might be willing to consider that being unavailable uh, to one's spouse in the long term uh, over a prolonged period might create a type of fault in divorce that maybe could shift uh, how the aftermath of the marriage is worked out. But I don't think that that amounts to any type of uh, obligation that could ever be met with force uh, where a spouse could demand sexual activity of their husband. Um, at, yeah, as I said, it, it at most could amount to weighing in as uh, into how uh, the divorce played out legally speaking. So, so yeah, I, I think it's actually fully equivalent uh, forcibly demanding sexual activity of a spouse to forcibly demanding sexual activity of a stranger. And I would expect the same legal penalties uh, associating with each. Now again, uh, this view that I'm, uh, this stance that I'm taking here, it probably would not be considered so cut and dry 50 years ago, 100 years ago in the United States. The West's uh, perspective on this topic 
has evolved significantly in uh, in the last 50 years. But at this point, I don't think that this is a particularly unusual position uh, for a Westerner to take. But uh, Egyptian society is different at this point. But as they are publishing it on the internet, I certainly feel comfortable uh, laying the criticism. Um, the si uh, sixth uh, criticism they offer is uh, equal inheritance between men and women. That's the end of the critici uh, criticism. For me, equal inheritance is clearly a good thing, uh, although I believe that the reason that they were felt comfortable making that criticism uh, so short is that Islamic law is relatively clear on this topic. So for them, it's a slam dunk win to say this differs from uh, from how Sharia has typically um, set rules for this topic. But I don't see Sharia as, as being particularly worth preserving. Um, but so the seventh criticism uh, criticism they offer is that this uh, this UN document would replace guardianship with partnership, and it would lead to full sharing of roles within the family between men and women, such as spending child care, and home chores. Again, the, this strikes me as unambiguously good. Uh, I don't think that men are the guardians of women. Uh, I don't think women are the guardians of men either. I think that equal partnerships in a relationship are healthy and they're proper and they're the best way to do things. So uh, they certainly need a lesson in spin if they're going to keep on publishing this uh, on the internet where Westerners uh, like me uh, can offer criticism on it. Although maybe they don't care. They're probably writing just for Egyptians. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I basically see all of that as unambiguously good. Um, uh, they also, uh, the eighth criticism is that full equality in marriage legislation, such as allowing Muslim women to marry non-Muslim men, an abolition of polygamy, dowry, and men take, uh, taking charge of family spending. Uh, they see that as harmful. I see that full equality as healthy. Uh, I, I, I don't think that people should be restricted to marry people within their religious uh, community. I, when it comes to polygamy, I'm uncomfortable with it. I'm not sure uh, I'm not. I, I'm not going to take a, a hard stance on whether it should be legal or illegal, as it's often been practiced. It uh, it has been part of a very controlling culture. Typically, uh, one man getting married to a bunch of women in a weird little uh, commune out uh, out somewhere, um, and it it does. It's an unhealthy ideal of marriage. But that isn't the only way that polygamy could work. Uh, I, I certainly would, I would never recommend, uh, recognize polygamous marriage, whether they're liberal or conservative. I don't think that that's what marriage is for. I think it, it is for when two people decide to merge uh, their identity to some extent. And because it's two people, it's a very particular thing. Um, and I think that permitting larger agglomerations would uh, would stretch the definition and would stretch the traditional privileges uh, in that type of partnership too much. But, um, but I'm not sure whether practicing it without the recognition of the law should be illegal. Maybe I, I would be more comfortable just uh, busting cults of that sort in general. Uh, and there are a lot of ways that you can do that. It, it doesn't necessarily mean the police are going to knock down the door and divide people, but rather having universal public education, not permitting homeschooling, I think that those would be relatively healthy ways to preventing the types of cultural control that have led to polygamous cults that have uh, effectively abused or neglected people in society. Um, uh, abolition of dowry, I, I don't have, I, I guess dowry is kind of unsavory, uh, 
to the extent that it, it in more traditional societies it has been part of that notion of uh, the man providing for the woman and uh, and him having control over her and and that kind of keeping the thumb uh, on women by not making it easy for them to be uh, economically self-reliant as part of that system it's unsavory although just having it be an essentially token thing uh, between people who are clearly self-sufficient and really do have a substantial and real choice as to whether to get marriage I wouldn't be so bothered by it as just a, uh, an empty cultural element uh, a lot of the uh, I would be willing to ban the cultural element if it would uh, effectively ban um, the uh, uh, if it would effectively end real problems uh, of the uh, of the having the thumb on someone type control but if it's not necessary then that sort of a ban would be probably undesirable um, and I, I think it's fine for women to take charge of fa uh, a family spending and actually this is an area where the Muslim Brotherhood is taking stands that are at ends with Islam as it has often been practiced in, uh, in history um, Islam has has often permitted women a substantial amount of uh, economic independence um, uh, at least over the centuries uh, women often had their own uh, their own funds that husbands weren't legally permitted to touch they had legal rights that were substantially independent of their husband although in in recent uh, years these traditional rights have uh, diminished but there are interesting books about how Sharia worked in practice in some past centuries that are worth uh, considering uh, on this topic <clears throat> the uh, ninth criticism that's laid is that removing the authority of divorce from husbands and placing it in the hands of judges and sharing all property after divorce again that sounds healthy that uh, the traditional divorce of um, uh, of, of saying it three times which traditionally but not always has been limited to the husband in divorce I think that that's generally unhealthy it's probably a good thing to have divorce be primarily a civil thing and uh, and ensuring that women and men have equal access to it is uh, something I consider absolutely essential I don't think it's fair or acceptable to have divorce only available to men now again traditional Islam had uh, provided measures to deal with uh, with this to a certain extent uh, and there were contracts that were part of uh, divorce that could um, work out differently depending on the means of divorce but many of these nuances have been lost in within the last uh, century or so uh, the tenth matter uh, canceling the need for a husband's consent in matters like travel work or use of contraception I don't think the, hu uh, the husband should need to consent uh, on these topics uh, or at least I think that having the default of only the husband needing to consent and not the wife I think that's unhealthy I any marriage is going to involve a certain amount of negotiation but it shouldn't start with the husband having the upper hand and I think that it would be fair and healthy for uh, for either both genders uh, in the marriage presuming that it's not a, a same same gender marriage um, both people need to start from the uh, from the uh, negotiating point that they have an equal right to lay equal kinds and equal uh, amounts of obligations on each other uh, I I think in general uh, having any type of legal recognition uh, of these is undesirable it's not uh, it shouldn't be the role of the state nor should 
uh, either partner have the ability to perform violence on the other to control them in matters like travel, work, or use of contraception. Um, in general, I, I think that a healthy marriage is one where you ideally have a certain amount of common understanding on these topics, and either people find a way to make these things work within the marriage, or they find out that they're incompatible and they get a divorce. And having the threat of divorce hanging, up, uh, hanging over <clears throat> over either person is part of what uh, it's part of the power dynamic of the relationship that makes it healthy because both people realize I could walk away if things really don't work and I also have things that I want out of the marriage um, and so I'm going to be nervous about going too far I'm going to be nervous about pushing my partner more than than they could possibly go but I'm also not going to be too shy about talking about what I want or need. And so there's a healthy tension there. So uh, those are the uh, those are the ten uh, objections that they have. I'm going to quickly read through uh, the 16 steps policy agenda that I see uh, the UNWoman.org has put up for this. Again, there will be links to this in my video description. One ratify international and regional, uh, regional treaties that protect the rights of women and girls and ensure that national laws and services meet international rights uh, standards. I think that's, uh, that's generally healthy. There's a lot of potential stuff to consider in the details there. UN documents generally tend to be vague. Um, but yeah, I, I think that that's not, there's nothing objectionable uh, in that uh, as worded. Adopt and enforce laws to end impunity, being, uh, bring perpetrators of violence against women and girls to justice, and provide women with reparations and remedy for the violations perpetrated against them. Again, sounds healthy. We've recently seen uh, um, social movements in India regarding this, and uh, and those are healthy. It's it's good to make sure that people have legal re recourse when they're assaulted, whether they're married or not married. Um, and ideally the people who are sexually assaulted should never face legal penalty for having sex outside of marriage. That's just rubbish. Um, it's not like they had a choice. Um, three, develop uh, national and local action plans for ending violence against women and girls in every country that bring the government, women's, and other civil society organizations, the mass media, in the private sector into a coordinated collective front against such human rights violations. That sounds generally healthy. It is possible to take this too far um, in some ways. Uh, so people are, are, some of these organizations have campaigned against pornography or campaigned against uh, certain types of things that they consider politically incorrect justified by this. And I, I think that those are inappropriate responses to this type of concern. But still, generally, I think that this is a decent, well-worded concern. It, it all depends on what you do with it. Four, uh, make justice uh, accessible to women, uh, women and girls by providing free legal and specialized services and increasing women in law enforcement and frontline services. I think this is a very healthy uh, thing to do. If you have police that are only men, then they won't take, a, uh, or at least they might not take abuse of women uh, seriously. We've often seen uh, people attempt to report rape to police and the police would laugh at them or not devote many resources to investigation. Um, that's unfortunate. Uh, having more of a gender distribution in, in the police force helps deal with that and providing free legal and specialized services. Imagine a society where uh, a woman passed right from, uh, from living under her parents to living under a husband, and then the husband begins to get abusive. If she doesn't have easy access to legal services, she won't have much of a way of breaking out from that, uh, from that marriage, from that relationship. And I think she should have the ability to do that. Um, battered women are a problem. Uh, I mean, not in the sense that that they uh, they 
what I mean is that the battering of women, uh, that is a problem. Uh, patterns of abuse in relationships, particularly with women who have no self-sufficiency or effectively no access to legal counsel, that, that's a problem. And, and providing these types of resources um, helps make society more healthy. And to a certain extent, even the possibility of this lessens the amount of power that some men ha uh, feel they have in relationships and forces them to treat their spouses uh, or their significant others more respectfully. So it's not just uh, a hard power, it's a soft power as well. It shifts um, relationships that were always unequal into ones that are more equal because people have recourse. Um, uh, five, and impunity towards conflict-based uh, or towards conflict-related sexual violence by prosecuting perpetrators in conflict and post-conflict conflict contexts and fulfilling survivors' rights to comprehensive reparations programs that are non-stigmatizing and have a transformative effect uh, impact on uh, women and girls' lives. That's a mouthful. It's essentially an extension of the uh, fourth idea above. And uh, th the focus on prosecution, it, it, it doesn't, strictly speaking, need to be there, but the availability um, of it, again, produces better behavior of, uh, of those who uh, commit domestic violence, as well as people in, uh, in relationships that would potentially not feel a lot of counterweight towards uh, their, their problem with violence. Now, again, it's not always the, the whole of the story, but that doesn't mean it's not worth addressing. Six, ensure universal access to critical services at minim uh, minimum. Women and girls' emergency and immediate needs should be met through free 24-hour uh, hotlines, prompt intervention for their safety and protection, safe housing, and shelter for them and their children, counseling, and psychosocial uh, support, post-rape care, and free legal aid to understand their rights and, and options. Uh, this is more of an extension of the above. Safe houses are very important to providing people a means to escape from uh, systems of control that have never granted them effective agency in society. And all, all of these other things uh, are supplemental ways to deal with, uh, with abuse situations. Uh, seven, uh, train providers of frontline services, particularly police, lawyers and judges, social workers and health personnel to ensure that they follow quality standards and protocols. Services should be confidential, sensitive and convenient to women survivors. So yeah, this, is, uh, this calls for funding to make sure that, uh, that all of these uh, state and non-state agencies that help women uh, and, and men, uh, because it isn't only available to women, to, to help uh, victims in these types of relationships from uh, knowing their rights, from having a place to stay when they feel the need to get out of a bad situation, and helping them deal with society afterwards. Uh, these are all good things. Uh, Eight, providing adequate public resources to implement existing laws and policies, recognizing the devastating costs and consequences of violence against women, not only for the lives directly affected, but to society and the economy at large, and to public budgets. So yeah, we need to fund the institutions that are uh, performing this work, so that uh, they're performing the work um, or so that uh, so that they can actually afford to perform the work. Uh, nine, uh, collect, analyze, and disseminate national data on prevalence, causes, and consequences of violence against women and girls, policies of survivors and perpetrators, and progress and gaps in the implementation of national policies, plans, and laws. Very healthy uh, stuff. If we're going to tackle this problem, we need to consider uh, or we need to at least collect data about it so that we can shape our policy correctly. And it's worth noting that typically there's a, uh, there are a number of social workers in many cities in the West that deal with problems like these. They need to have the data they need. 
to uh, be well trained um, and uh, and to have the most effective uh, means to uh, to lessen these problems. Uh, Ten, invest in gender equality and women's empowerment to tackle the root causes of violence against women and girls. Uh, so yeah, we we need to raise people in a way that doesn't nudge them into always being uh, in the custody of men. Uh, and we need to raise them, uh, raise uh, men and women to treat each other with respect. Uh, and it's not just in cross-gender relations, but same-gender relations as well. And, uh, and again, this isn't just about uh, men being abusive. Women can be abusive as well. And uh, it's, it's a general problem. Uh, and finding ways to uh, to raise people uh, so that they'll handle each uh, so that they'll handle relationships in a healthy way that can avoid a lot of pain and a lot of mess in society throughout the rest of people's lives. Eleven, enhance women's economic empowerment by ensuring women's rights to own land and property, to inheritance, equal pay for equal work, and safe and decent employment. Uh, I covered this to a certain extent earlier. So if women uh, are always dependent on men for their income, for access to their property, then they'll never have the ability to properly respond to domestic violence. And this, is prim this particular topic is primarily one about uh, women versus men. Uh, and I, I use the word versus there loosely. But it is one where women have, uh, in some societies, are traditionally disadvantaged. Uh, if women aren't economically sufficient before they enter a marriage, then they won't have a healthy power dynamic uh, within the marriage. Uh, Twelve, increase public awareness and social uh, mobilization to stop violence against women and girls and to enable them to uh, break the silence and seek justice and support. So this might not be as much of a problem in the West, although it still is uh, some problem in the West, but in many other countries, uh, rape victims face potential violence if they speak up on these topics because it's extramarital, uh, extramarital uh, sex. And that needs to change. If you're a victim of a crime, you shouldn't be uh, afraid to talk about it and we need to shift uh, societal uh, attitudes about this as much as is needed to effectively deal with the problem of, uh, of relationship violence. Um, Thirteen, engage the mass media in shaping public opinion and challenging the harmful gender, uh, gender norms that perpetrate violence against women and girls. Yeah, more of the same, it's a good thing. Uh, Fourteen, work for and with young people as champions of change. This is essential, and this is one of those areas where a lot of people don't realize that you can typically only shape a person so much once they become an adult. Uh, people are shaped throughout their whole childhood by their parents, by society, by TV, but we become less flexible as we age. Our attitudes become developed, uh, we decide to defend them and uh, or we just decide I'm too old to, to change how I think about sex, gender, uh, roles in society. Um, and so engaging with younger people is uh, a healthy way to, uh, to hope for uh, changes in these norms that are healthy. And um, Yeah. Uh, and 15, mobilize men and boys of all ages and walks of life to take a stand against violence against women and girls and to foster equality and gender solidarity. So I find the notion of, of this as a solidarity, uh, solidarity concern a little bit unusual in that it's certainly a good... Uh, Solidarity is a good way to think about it if, you, if you're not committed to it for another reason. But I think that we should be committed to it for another reason that should be stronger than solidarity. And that is that we're concerned for society. We have goals for society uh, 
and uh, we're vested in them because we're vested in society. This isn't uh, about one gender saving the other, one gender pitying the other. Uh, it's not about being an ally. It's rather about deciding what kind of society we want to live in. Uh, that is one which is empowering to people of both genders, one that doesn't really care a lot about one gender versus the other, and then deciding to fight for that society, uh, to try and convince people that that kind of society is a good thing. But for people who, uh, who aren't uh, thinking on such so grand a scale, solidarity works. I just see it as a lesser path. Um, being an ally works, but it's a lesser path and it's not how I approach activism. I've never considered myself an ally to any cause. Either I believe in the cause or I don't believe in the cause. Um, but, uh, but yeah, talking to men and boys uh, about this is, it's, it's a healthy, uh, healthy approach. You can't just focus on one gender. It can't just be women doing the activism because in the end, if when uh, if somebody is is heterosexual, they're going to be in a marriage, and if uh, the person that they're married to, oh, I, I let me correct that. If they decide to get married, and a lot of people do, a lot of people decide that they want that, then um, uh, and please excuse the sound. I have a second cat that is uh, anyhow. Um, if they're going to, uh, if they decide to get married. Uh, in a heterosexual marriage, then they're eventually going to need to, uh, to uh, they'll be in a relationship where the attitudes of their partner are relevant. And, um, and so if, if, those, if their partner is a guy, and if their partner has never really been engaged on these issues, has never really thought about these issues, then the relationship might not be as, uh, as well grounded as it could be if we decide to engage people of both genders on this topic. Um, and the 16th uh, thing that, that's called for here, donate to the UN Trust Fund to end the violence against women, that's not, uh, yeah, that, that's more of a, a practical matter. Now, I, I certainly think that the United Nations has a number of very worthy uh, causes and organizations that you might donate to. You might decide to donate your money to other worthy causes as well or to other organizations pursuing these causes. Donate to whoever you like. That's not what this video is about. Uh, but in general, I think the UN has a very healthy uh, program here. Now, that isn't, uh, isn't to say that people might not object to particular implementations of these ideas. But the ideas themselves seem healthy. And uh, that's the end of this video. I, I welcome your comments. I would be happy to have a discussion with you uh, on, uh, on the topic in the comments section. Um, 